Streaming March 21st, only on BET Plus. A BET Plus original series, Diara from Detroit. You came down here to tell us that your date is missing. So after he ghosted you... I did not get ghosted. I think he was taken. One mystery. We need to find him. Zero chill. What am I supposed to solve? Every crime in Detroit? From executive producer Kenya Barris, starring Morris Chestnut in Introducing Diara Kilpatrick. Diara from Detroit. Streaming March 21st on BET Plus. Hey, it's Will Friedell. And Sabrina Bryan. And we're the hosts of the new podcast, Magical Rewind. You may know us from some of your favorite childhood TV movies like My Date with the President's Daughter. And the Cheetah Girls movies. Together we're sitting down to watch all the movies you grew up with and chat with some of your favorite stars and crew that made these iconic movies happen. So kick back, grab your popcorn, and join us. Listen to Magical Rewind on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Brought to you by State Farm. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Happy Friday and good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football giants. John Schmelk, Lance Meadow with you. The phone number, give us a call, 201-939-4513. Well, we have started our Pro Day series. Yesterday, Paul Dottino and Jonathan Casillas took the trip across Oregon, the lovely state of Oregon. I've the Oregon Trail. Oh, and and yeah. listen to that yet. Uh, no one, I believe... Uh, died of any diseases on the Oregon Trail, which has been known to happen. <laughs> yeah. For those of you that play the old computer game from That's the right. late 80s and early 90s. Um, I'm trying to think of um, what some of the things you could catch on the Oregon Trail in that game was. Well, I picture the horse and buggy ride, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. That the you wagon. took, the wagon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Boy, we're really testing the memory banks here. I wasn't mentally it's been prepared. A while. I know. I'm so involved in Texas prospects this morning and this yes. afternoon that you know, I put the Oregon Trail on the back burner. I'll have to get back to you next week. And we are point. taking the Oregon Trail down to Texas in just a couple of minutes. We're going to be joined by Anwar Richardson, who covers Texas football for orangebloods.com, a former NFL reporter as well. And boy, you can tell why this team was able to make the college football playoffs. They have a lot of yeah. very good players, and you know that's with their quarterback, Quinn Ewer, staying back uh, for another season. Uh, they have players on both sides of the ball coming out, uh, could have as many as three or maybe even four first-round picks, uh, depending on how the draft goes. So there'll be a lot to talk about with Anwar, and he is going to join us right now, or at least in a moment here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Pearson's going to get him on hold here, and we're going to talk some. And he used to cover the NFL, too, so he's a pretty good feel of um, how skill sets should transfer over to the National Football League. And now we are joined by the one and only Anwar Richardson. Again, he covers the Texas Longhorns, um, does a great job for orangebloods.com, former NFL reporter on the Bucks and Lions beat. Anwar, you got John Schmelk and Lance Meadow here on Big Blue Kickoff Live up here in New Jersey. I'm sure yep. you're doing much better than the four, high of 42-degree <laughs> weather we have up here in New York City. I mean, listen, it, I'm suffering here in Austin, Texas. Um, you know, as you guys know, like, no, it's, a, it's a place that no one ever wants to move to, right? <laughs> uh, no <one> want, <laughs> it's only 64 today, the high of be 75, so... I, I will I will suffer uh, here for you guys, and um, as I uh, you know go drop the top on the convertible and drive around today. So you guys, uh, I'm not saying it's not a humble brag, but no, I appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me on. You know, I, I grew up. I'll be honest, with you, I grew up as a Giants fan. Uh, so you guys just thinking about being on the show today really took me down memory lane because some of my early memories when I started thinking about the Phil Sims and Joe Morris and. Super Bowl 21 and Dave Meggett, right? And so I was just, I, I had a lot of good memories. And so just thinking of you guys, you guys actually put me in a very, very good mood today. So thank you. Where'd you grow up? I, I grew up in the Bronx. Nice. Oh, wow. I did okay. not know that. That's awesome. That's great. Uh, Lance, yeah, it's, Lance and I are both Brooklyn guys. Yeah, yeah. So, we're, we're, so we may have cut school 
and cut and cross paths around the same time, right? <laughs> yeah, but grew up in the you know the, the arcades, the pizzerias, like all those kind of things, man. It's just great memories. So yeah, you know when you grew up in New York, you got to choose one of them, right? You got to choose you know your baseball team, your football team, and sure. your basketball team, right? So well, I'm uh, assuming you're a Yankees guy, given the fact that you course. grew up in the boogie down Bronx. I mean, that would yes. be yes. The, the biggest surprise of all if you uh, shifted towards Mets territory after laying all that, that, that out. Yeah. That, 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 the stadium is still, it's, it always smelled to me whenever I went there. <laughs> uh, so I never was a huge fan of Shea Stadium. But I did like it, obviously, when Doc and Dwight were there. Those were, those were fun to watch those guys uh, for those years. But yes, Yankees, uh, Giants, and of course, Knicks. You know, so those, those are that, that was my trifecta. Uh, but loved it. So, like I said, you guys have put me in a fantastic mood today. Well, we're excited to talk about Texas prospects uh, on Warren. We were saying right before we brought you on that it should surprise no one how Texas was able to get to the college football playoffs based on the number of NFL prospects they have coming out this year. Could have three uh, first-round picks, maybe four yeah. if something weird happens in, in this year's draft. So why don't we start on offense because I think that's where right. um, some of the top guys are situated maybe a little bit more heavily and I want to start with A.D. Mitchell. I know a lot of mm. people have the second wide receiver at LSU, Brian Thomas Jr., as wide receiver four in this draft. I have Adonai Mitchell. I think his combination of size, speed, and overall athleticism is off the charts. But I know maybe, and this comes from my film watching, not as consistent or as dominant as maybe those traits would dictate Mm -hmm, he mm should have been. So I'll start with that simple question. Why don't you think he was quite as dominant as maybe his traits should dictate? You know what? Adonai Mitchell made an admission during the combine that I had never heard a single player say in probably maybe 30 years in this business. And he said, I never really ran full speed when I wasn't going to get the ball because I didn't want people to know how fast I was. <laughs> I, and, I, I've, and I've never heard a person brag about, you know what, I kind of I kind of half-ass it sometimes, to be quite honest with you, <laughs> as, as a point of pride. But that's what he said. So I think that has something to do with what you're, what you're pointing to, is that for whatever reason, in his mind, he decided like he was going to pick and choose whenever he would go hard. Well, I, I think any, as you know, when you get to the, the next level, they they will coach that out of you. Oh yeah, and they, they will tell you that's them. not that's not that's not what we're going to do here. Because yeah, he ran a four three four at the at the combine, and I didn't know that he actually was that was that quick. But you know, he ran a four three four, had a thirty nine point five inch vertical, eleven four on the broad jump. So you, to your point, he's very athletic. He does have that size at that six two two oh five. Um, he can. He's got a, an extensive route tree. He came from the University of Georgia, spent one year here at Texas, had a, a dynamic, you know, um, impact while he was here. So, I I do believe that, you know, when guys go and they look at the film, and that's obviously what the will count the most. They'll look at the film and they'll say, incredibly productive. Um, did it against very good teams. So you know, the Texas obviously played Alabama this season. They had the Big Twelve schedule. Obviously, he was a guy that played extremely well against Washington, right? So, you know, you know, you know what you're going to get from this guy. And I just think teams are going to look at him and say to themselves, you know what, we can get even more. The sky's the limit. And Steve Sarkeesian, it helps that he's got an offense that translates to the NFL. And so because of that, I think people will say automatically, like, okay, that's a first-round guy. You know, he won't be the first guy off the board, per se, for Texas but he probably will be the first offensive player to go. Anwar, as a follow-up, because, I mean, I find it fascinating that a player admits that he didn't go full speed when he wasn't getting the ball because the first thing that comes to my mind is you're telling the defense essentially when you're not getting the football if they know or they could sense that you don't have blazing speed. Have you heard any feedback from Texas coaches or anybody else that has spoken publicly since that was revealed and whether or not that has presented perhaps more red flags or they've defended him actually subscribing to that school of thought? I think it was a shoulder shrug when it was all said and done and from, from, the, from the staff. And, I, you know, they, they still think that the film is good enough for him. And I think they still feel pretty solid that he's going to be a first-round pick. 
Uh, I feel like that's kind of a correctable thing. And like I said, never heard a person admit that. Never. And I've sure. heard people say a lot of crazy things. Uh, uh, you know, I was there, you know, at a combine where, you know, Manta Teo had to answer for, you know, a girlfriend who didn't exist. So I've seen it all. That's one of, that was a first for me. Um, but nonetheless, I think people, will, they show this fraud day and they feel pretty good that, you know, overall, I hope she'll still check all the boxes for teams and probably needs to go ahead and play hard on every single play. Yeah, I would imagine so. And I'm sure that's a question. He's <laughs> yeah. in the, I'm sure when, he, the I'm sure when yeah. he does his 30 <laughs> visits with NFL teams, that's going to be a very common question <laughs> that he's yeah. asked by uh, receivers, coaches, and head Absolutely. coaches when he's there. All right, I want to jump over to his other wide receiver, Xavier Worthy. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I wasn't surprised he was the fastest receiver at the combine. I think the 4 one number probably was like, okay, that's really, really fast. So that was impressive. But yeah. I don't want to talk to you about the speed because I think we know the speed's there. We see it on tape. We know he's mm-hmm. fast and he can win over the top. I have two questions. So this is a two-parter for you. One, gotcha. the route tree. How much mm-hmm. was he used on routes that go over the middle? Because, you know, sometimes lighter guys get a little nervous when they mm-hmm. have to go over the middle. They might have to deal with some contact. That's the first part of the question. And number two, did you see that 165-pound frame show up on tape? Because i got to be honest, when you watch him, I don't feel like he's a guy that plays to avoid contact. I think he did break some tackles to gain some yards after the catch on some of those stop routes. So mm-hmm. the, 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 that's my two-part question for him as I try gotcha. to figure out how that frame and, and route tree might affect yeah. how teams evaluate him. Great questions. Um, so I, I will say this as relates to Xavier Worthy. Uh, the route tree is there. I, 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 you know, you would be – I would say this. He's no John Ross. Okay. Good and, answer. And so, <laughs> yeah, and, that, and I think because that's what you that, that would be my instant thought is right. okay. Well, we're just John Ross, and you're going to be in and out of the league in the next in a, in a couple of years. He can run the route, okay. So he can he can go across the middle. Um, he can he can definitely you know obviously he can fly. We know that. Uh, but I don't think he's a person. He's never shied away. The thing I've I've always wondered is, okay, is this guy going to shy away from contact? I've never seen him shy away from contact. I've never, I, and I thought, okay, well, he's, you know, 165. I mean, he's light in the butt. Of course, you're just going to get on, on the line of scrimmage and just push him around. But he's got that lean muscle. And some guys have just got that lean muscle. And have you ever seen, like, guys back in high school or something like that? They were thin, but they can do 100 push-ups. Yep. You know, I think he's kind of like that on that route where you're not, you're not just going to this easily – just knock him off the line of scrimmage and think to yourself, like, that's it. You know, we're just going to sit on him within the next first five yards. The thing that Xavier Worthy does better than any receiver that I I really have seen in in recent years um, is he makes the hard thing look difficult. He makes the hard thing look easy. And that hard thing is getting open. It, it, and I know it's, it sounds simplistic, right? But that's the hard thing. And, and when you look at him and you look at his film and you go, if you go back and watch it, you'll see he has five yards of separation. Oh, yeah. Six yards of separation. Separa- like before the ball is even there. And that's what he makes look easy. You know, before Quinn Ewers really kind of settled in a little bit last year, really it, before, the, prior to that, Xavier Worthy had Casey Thompson – as a quarterback, and then, of course, he had Hudson Carter, he had Quinn Ewers. And some of the frustration that was happening for him early in his career, especially his freshman year, was that he was open a lot. And they, didn't get, they couldn't get him the ball as often as they could. And so, you know, so he's a guy that he, he can get open. He, he has some drops uh, as, a, as a sophomore season. But when we end up finding out later, and then really after the season, is that he was playing that year with a broken uh, hand. At least there was a broken bone in his hand. To what degree, we don't know. I don't believe it required surgery. But he did have a broken bone in his hand that, that came out later. So we know he was able to play through pain. He never complained about it. So the, 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 the staff always loved that he was a good teammate as relates to that. Now, you know, the thing about you know, you know, Xavier, he doesn't talk a lot. He's, I think he's, come, he's, he's kind of come out of his shell a little bit more this year. But he's a good guy, a good locker room guy. Uh, I think he's a person that he won't be – my, my, uh, you know, my, my comparison for him is probably more like a Deshaun Jackson, if I have to think of a comparison. That's a good one. Um, 
I think that's what I look at. Like, you know, a smaller guy, but he, he'll get open. I think if you pair him with a bunch of other good receivers and now you have that as a threat, I think that's where he needs to be. I don't ne- necessarily look at him and say, okay, that needs to be your automatic number one. But if you pair him with somebody else, and if you, especially if you've got three, a good tight end, like a Kansas City might be a real, you know, a good situation for him, guy like that. Uh, Tennessee, maybe potentially something like that. Um, I think you'll start, you'll really see something from him. But again, I, he's not a one trick pony where that's all it's about. So I think I look at him as a late first, early second rounder. And I think if he finds a good home, uh, he's a guy that can last for a long time in the league. I want to stay with the receiving threats. Let's jump to tight end. Uh, Jatavian Sanders Uh, clearly is a weapon in its own right. Uh, Wasn't asked to block much. So one of the questions I have for you, Anwar, is his upside as a blocker. But I'm going to use the first round picks that we've seen. I know he may be projected to go in the second round, but the Sam Laporte is the Dalton Kincaids last year. You know, guys that made significant impacts on offense and made smooth transitions. Is he fall in that line where you could say, all right, hey, we're not drafting him to block, so let's not stress about it? Or do you see that they're going to need him to block based on his skill set and therefore he'll have to show more in that department? Here's here's the tricky part about Jatavian Sanders, and this this will, um, like, all I know how to do is keep it a buck and keep it real. He At his pro day uh, he, on the bench press, he benched it eight times. Eight times. That, as you guys know, that's not good. That's not that 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 is. It was only eight reps on the bench press. He had a twenty-nine inch vertical, uh, only a nine-six on the broad jump. And look, this is one of those things that we always know that teams will go back to the tape. And, and which on war, by the way, is in line with his forty time at the combine. So that all yeah, kind of goes yeah. into the same bucket then, where the athleticism matches, and it's not where teams want it to be. I think, yeah, and that, that's where I think was. So I think he walked, walked into this season and everyone's thinking, okay, he's probably the second tight end taken off the board, right? Sure. After the Georgia kid, he's supposed to be number two. Um, but he's not testing like that to me. No. I don't think, you know, he's not testing like a guy that you want to take in the first round. He's, I'm not quite sure about second round if I'm just being a buff and keeping it real with you guys. Like, I'm not, I, I'd be, you know, you GMs, don't get fired for whiffing in the seventh round. But they do get fired for whiffing in the first round. Okay, that's, that's how you lose your job is if you mess up your first round pick. And especially the second round pick is a commodity as well. So Detainian Sanders is going to have to be a guy that teams go back, they look have to look at the film, and they're going to have to tell themselves, okay, we see enough on film there. Was, was he a dynamic blocker? Like, not necessarily, you know. And so is he very athletic? Sure. But when you only throwing up eight reps on the bench press, it's a red flag. It's a red flag to say, okay, is this guy putting in the work in the in the weight room? Is he putting in the work in the off season? Like, and you know, the guy, you know this. You guys have done this for a long time. Teams want they want to minimize risk, yeah. you know. And so when I start taking, when I got to take a gamble on the guy, now now I got to start thinking about, okay, is that going to be a third round? If he slips to me, then then maybe I'll take that gamble. Am I taking a gamble in the first? You don't want to do that. Am I taking a gamble early in the second? Probably not so much. So, Jatavian Sanders is a guy that I think he's going to have to have a team that really has convinced themselves that what they're seeing uh, from an athletic standpoint, they can coach certain things or coach certain things up, which is a real surprise because I'm honest, he was a five star coming out of high school. And so, the, the, but the numbers that he's put up are just not impressive to me. Um, and so he's a guy that second round, day three, you know, I think that's probably, you know, I, that's probably where, where he probably needs to be, maybe third round is somewhere in that, uh, just based off the, how he's been testing. Just, just, just to dig into that answer a little bit, Anwar, to follow up on mm-hmm. Lance asked you, I know he's not a guy that's known for his blocking. Is he a willing blocker that's a try-hard guy and, you know, just, you know, maybe doesn't have the physical ability to block some of those bigger defensive ends? Or is he a guy that you're going to have to coax the want and the effort out of him to participate in the run game? I mean, he can block. He can block. But, I mean, dude, when you're throwing up eight reps on the bench press, <laughs> no, I hear you. Gonna, you ain't going to be blocking for long. You know, <laughs> like that's. That's what that thing is for. So people don't understand that the, the best press is 
you got to push off. You got to push. Like, how many times can you do that? And so, you know, can you get him a little bit stronger? So, I mean, you know, they had he, he was able to come in there as a blocker. Um, Gunnar Helm, one of the other tight ends, is, was really good at the blocking situation as well. But, guys, I just, I just again, as much as I talked up Adonai, as much as I talked up Xavier, I, I'm a little bit, little bit more lukewarm on Ad, on 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 the table just because of how he's testing. So, I, can he block? I guess. But now that I see the numbers, I have, it makes me want to go look back. I never. I, I'll say this: at no point in the season did I ever view him as a liability as a blocker. Okay. So I will. I will say that. Good. So I never more viewed him as a liability. Um, but the way he's testing on the next level. He tests as a guy that would be a liability. Well, that's why the combine gives you some more food for thought based on what you've seen on film. There's no doubt about that. Let's stay on the offensive side of the ball. Jonathan Brooks Mm -hmm. is intriguing to me, Anwar, because Mm -hmm. the sample Mm -hmm. size is tiny, but the sample size is pretty damn impressive. And I understand when you're playing behind B. John Robinson and Rashawn Mitchell, okay, you're not going to get on the field much, but... Uh, Rashawn Johnson, excuse me, went to the Bears. But I guess the Mm -hmm. question is then, if I'm a general manager, is that a flash of what we saw this past season? Or is that just all of a sudden him getting fortunate because of all the talent around him at Texas? Mm -hmm. How do you interpret that to try to get a better read on where he profiles and where he fits on the NFL level? You know, it was really interesting when you when you lost the, when Texas lost a guy like B. John Robinson. The thought was, well, you're not going you're not going to find anybody to replace him, right? And sure. then Brooks comes in and through ten games had rushed for one thousand three, you know, thirty nine yards and, and ten touchdowns. His numbers were comparable to where B. John was, and in some areas they were actually better through that stretch of time, right? It, it was like it was neck and neck and sometimes better in certain categories. The big thing that Brooks is, is facing to me is that he's coming off the ACL. You know, so he did, he did have the ACL injury, um, and he's a guy that more than likely you probably won't have until training camp. Uh, you know, he's a guy, you, clearly you, you draft him, he's doing nothing during your rookie mini camp. He's probably, you keep him light work during your OTAs. And really, training camp is when you probably try to unleash him a little bit more, and you probably let him go slowly. He, he from a stat standpoint, he was the number one guy in in the country for a large portion of the season, and the best running back in the country. You you just got to feel comfortable. So, so when you talk about the combine, you talk about food for thought. What the medicals look like, that's going to be a huge thing for him. And when teams bring him in and analyze them as well. You know, that's what, what, what's going to be is like, hey, can he make a 100% recovery? If he can, uh, and they feel really good about taking him, again, you're probably not taking him in the first round. You're probably maybe taking him in the second round at, at some point and seeing what he can do. But I think, you know, you take him in the second round and you just you store him for uh, training camp, then I think you're good to go. Uh, if he slips a little bit further down just because of the knee and concerns about the knee, I think teams will be happy, and I think teams will be satisfied. Again, you don't really want it. You know running backs are going to be banged up. Sure. And so you, you, you know for the most part you, you're not going to have a lot of running backs that live to that second contract anyway. So if you can find a guy who's serviceable the way I think he would be, like, again, not, not only you know, he's a good blocker, he's got breakaway speed. The, I, the interesting thing about the whole story about Jonathan Brooks is that he didn't start the season as the starting running back. Uh, there was a freshman out of Florida by the name of T.J. Baxter. He was actually going to be the starting running back. He was the starting running back. He got banged up, and Brooks comes in as the backup and then has this kind of season that he had. Wow. So, um, so, yeah, so Brooks is, you know, Brooks is, is finding himself in a good situation. I, I think he'll be good. I think he'll be serviceable on the next level. Um, but, again, to me, the big thing is the ACL – and what do teams, how do they feel about that? And they feel like, ah, it's, it's all good. Then, yeah, I think he'll be fine and serviceable. But, again, it may take a little bit of time uh, before he's ready to go. Last offensive player I want to touch on uh, real quick, Anwar. Okay. Again, we're, we're joined by Anwar Richardson, uh, covers Texas, does a great job. Uh, 
I liked what I saw from Christian Jones at the NFL Combine. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, I mean, at the uh, Senior Bowl, pardon me. I thought when they yeah. tried to move him into guard, he struggled a little bit, which I think makes sense because he was a tackle. But I think when he was mm-hmm. out there, at, 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 and I think they had him mostly at right tackle in the Senior Bowl, and I think that's where Texas played him too. Uh, you, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah. I, yeah. I thought he was, you know, maybe not the elite athlete you're looking at, at there, but mm-hmm. I feel like he was really, really good in, in Mobile, and I think – as a you know early day three pick as a guy you can develop into maybe a swing tackle down the road, I think he could be a valuable mm-hmm. player in the NFL. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. You know, the thing is, is that so he he ends up being one of these guys who was who was a super senior that because of the COVID uh, was able to come back for an additional year. So he's a, he's going to be a little bit of an older guy, you know that that that's come in here. Um, he's a guy that was developed by Kyle Flood, uh, the offensive, um, not only co-offensive coordinator, uh, but also the offensive line coach here. Uh, and, and yes, he tested well uh, at the combine. Uh, he's a big guy. I think the thing with, with him is that he played right tackle in college. And so because as a right tackle, he obviously, you, you know, you, 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 say, you said you want to swing guys. And so he's not going to be a guy that can play the left. Good so point. you got to have you got to have you got to have that you're going to have to have a position of need uh, for where he's at at the moment. So you know, so that's why I say like he's probably a day three ish kind of guy that you can throw in at that right tackle position specifically, right? Yeah. So uh, because it's okay to have a left tackle that you move over to right, but if he's primarily right with not really being strong at the left, I think that limits his options just a lo- little bit. But I think he'll come in. I think he'll be productive. I think his best years are ahead of him. He really wasn't that – I'll be honest with you, he wasn't that effective for the first few years. And then it's almost like the last two years is when he really took off. And last year was a really great year for him. So I, I like him as, as a, like I said, a day three guy. You get a guy like that in the fourth, fifth round, something to that effect. Um, you know, if you slip to the sixth, like you, that's 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 a great thing. But you get him in that fourth, fifth, uh, then he's a guy that I feel like could be you know a solid co- contributor on your team at some point. Yeah, as a quick follow up to that, I mean, I was reading mm-hmm. that he played left tackle his true junior year in 2021, struggled immensely, and I figure yeah. on where that's why they said, all right, we're going to move you back to right after he started on the right side previously. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, we've had conversations here with the Giants, Evan Neal, who actually was with Kyle Flood at Alabama, you know, whether or not mm. you can easily flip a guy. And on where it seems as if it comes back to footwork. I'm curious what you've yeah. seen out of his footwork and whether or not that bodes better for him as a run blocker as a pass to as opposed to a pass protector on the next level i think his footwork is good um he's one of these guys that uh he, he's, he's one of these guys that played soccer when he was younger so uh and, and, and obviously got bigger so it was kind of hard to you know continue <laughs> to do that but he, he his his roots are soccer and so if you believe it i, I i'm always a guy that I, I love, I love two sport guys, especially the guys that play football. I love guys who play soccer. And I love guys who play basketball. Or, or by guys, the way, wrestle for our offensive linemen too. I love that. Too. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, yeah, if you're a wrestler as an offensive lineman, stuff like that. Yeah, the, the, when, when we grew up, where being a two sport and three sport athlete was kind of the norm, as opposed to the yep. being doing the specialization all the time. Uh, so because he does has a soccer background. He does have that footwork that I think you're talking about, that footwork that you need. Like you said, left tackle, no. <laughs> he's not going he's not, he's not to make a living in the NFL at left tackle. He won't be around. The, I know it's not for long. He won't be there for long. Right tackle where he is. The footwork is there. I think like I said, I think he's getting better. I think as now because Kyle Flood, they've, they've only been there. That, that was only the third season, right? And so, you know, so they had a, a year to kind of develop him and then be able to use him over the last two years. And Kyle Flood has done a hell of a job. He's getting a lot out of him. Uh, and I think there's be another cook. And by the way, incredibly bright guy. And I know that's, that's always usually the case for offensive linemen. Incredibly bright. 
He's a sponge. I think he'll be a hard worker for somebody. So I think the talent is there. I think the future is bright because I think he's only starting now to tap into his potential. All right, Anwar, let's switch to defense. I don't want to start with Byron Murphy just because I don't think the Giants are going to be in a position to take him. Uh, we can you know, we can get a little thumbnail on him okay. a little bit later. But Devondre Sweat, I think, is someone that will land either in the second or early third round. And to me, the mm-hmm. bottom line with him is his weight, right? We, we know yeah. what he can do as a run stopper. He's a plugger. He's not a big upfield pass pressure type of guy. Uh, but he weighed in at 366 at the NFL Combine. He did not have his weight announced at the Senior Bowl, whether or not he stepped on the scale and, and is, is a matter of debate. But I would imagine the number was much higher than that 366 that he weighed in at the Combine. Yes. So yes. how much have you seen that weight fluctuate and how much of a worry is that along with the motor that goes along with it going to be for NFL teams when they watch his tape and they talk to the kid? I mean, it should be a concern. You know, I mean, like he, he got down to that weight for the combine that 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 means he we're, we're talking about a guy that was in the funny the 370s throughout the season i mean at the end of the day and again i know I, you know i love talking to you guys but i i gotta keep it real like you you don't see that many productive defensive linemen who are closing in on 400 pounds like that just that's just not the nfl right that's just not that's not how this thing goes right and so the, the, the question and the challenge is, okay, if we give this guy, but by, who, by the way, let me, hold on, let me find, find this thing out. This is, this is the most fascinating thing. Let me, let me find this. Uh, when, he, when he signed, by the way, uh, at, at, at Texas, hold on, I'm, I'm looking this up right now. He was a defensive tackle. Okay, here we go. You ready for this? Yeah. Uh, he committed to Texas in 2018. Uh, he was part of the uh, 2019 class. When he committed to Texas, he was six foot four and 265 pounds. Oh my God! Class of 2019, he he has gone over 370 at this moment. He's grown another person essentially. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you know, so if you're an NFL team, you got to say, but this guy's gained over a hundred pounds in college. What's he going to do when he ha- not not an NIL contract? What's he going to do when he has a, a pro contract and, and has the ability to just go out? Can we trust this guy in the offseason, right? Do you have to put weight stipulations in his contract? Like those kind of things that, you know, you start to wonder about. Is he a hell of a football player on a college level? Absolutely. You go back, whether it's the Murphy or you go back to Sweat, you go back and there, there's a game you want to turn on the film. You turn on the film for Texas versus Alabama of this past year and you you're going to see something that you don't see and you very very rarely saw if very rarely saw the Nick Saban era which was you saw a team go up to Tuscaloosa and bully around the University of Alabama they beat them by double digits and guys like Tavondre Sweat Byron Murphy were dominant in that game against a very good Alabama team a team that went to the playoffs right so He's got the ability, right? But the and so no, no one's questioning his ability. No one's going to question him as a player. But then on this next level, are you simply a two down guy, right? But you can't you, because we know because of that weight. And I think he ran like what was what he ran like a five. Uh, it was somewhere in the fives of what he ended up running in five three 40. or five four, I think something like that. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so we we know when a guy gets past your running back, you're not you're not you're you're out of that play. Yeah, five right? two so seven, five two seven. He ran. Okay, five two seven. So yeah, so a running back gets past you, you're out of the play, right? You're 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 an effective. You're not going you're not going to be close to getting getting back into that play. Um, that's the question, and so I think the question really becomes the weight. Can, can he can he get that thing under control? It's going to be a question. Can he play? Absolutely. But how effective can he be? How's that going to look like for him in the fourth quarter? He wasn't fatigued in games in, in, in college, but, you, but you're not playing against the TCUs and the Baylors of the world and Oklahoma State. Like you're going against grown men who are very strong, who know how to sit down a big guy like that. that that's my thing with Tavondre. If he can get that weight under control – I feel like if he can get somewhere in the 350s, 340s, and now, now all of a sudden you're cooking with grease. But when you're close to 400, man, it, it's going it's gonna, it's gonna to be the thing, I think, that 
has him down as a, as a day two guy just because of that weight. Well, Anwar, I was told Anani Mitchell said that Sweat didn't show his true speed when he knew that the runner wasn't coming towards him. So maybe that was why, <laughs> you know, we <laughs> get a true idea of what he could do. There's no concern over his conditioning. Absolutely. I, I want to bring Murphy into the conversation. I know John mentioned that, you know, maybe the Giants won't be in position to grab him. But I want to sort of draw a comparison between Murphy and Sweat. I think if you look at their numbers, you say, well, they weren't big sack guys, but they're more than just getting to the quarterback on where it's about what they create for others, the ability to yeah. clog the hole, stop the run. And I've heard Aaron Donald's name being thrown around in terms of comparisons for Murphy, but Donald, obviously, who just retired, a huge sack guy. So with Murphy, yeah. even though he has a significant impact on a game without necessarily getting to the quarterback and finishing, where do you see his ceiling about if you do want to get more pass rush and finish out of him, where he could potentially take that? You know, he does. He, you know, he does, He's one of those guys that I, I would say, like to your point, he does those things that you don't. You know, don't you may see from the stat standpoint, but when you're talking about being down there, uh, stopping in the run, um, I'll give you a stat that will help you understand Murphy. You have to do. You have to draw a little bit of a correlation here, but I think you guys can do it. Okay, Texas last year ranked second in the country in opponent third down conversion. Wow. Nobody converted against Texas uh, on third downs. The only team that was better than them in the country last year was Georgia. Outside of that, out of 177 attempts against Texas, only 47 times was that converted. That third down conversion led to a first down. What that means is guys like a Murphy, guys like Sweat, were effective at getting to the quarterback, at stopping the run, right, sure. and, 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 and being effective in those, in those areas. And so because he did uh, test so well at the combine, first of all, he ran a 4.87, uh, which is, you know, at, at, 300, at, at almost 300 pounds. He, he weighed in at 297 and ran a 4.87. That, that, that's that's, that's that's a hell of a lot of talent. And I remember I remember when I covered the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for years. Before I started doing college football, I was, I was an NFL writer. I covered uh, the Bucs and the Lions. I worked at Yahoo for a period of time covering the entire NFL. And I remember when I covered the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and John Gruden was the coach there. And one of the things that he told me was before one of the drafts, and he said, listen, when you find an athletic 300-pound man, you have to draft him. He said, when you find someone who's that athletic at 300 pounds, uh, whether it's offensive line, whether it's defensive line, you have to draft them because there are not a lot of athletic 300-pound men walking the face of the earth. Am I guessing that's the year they drafted Warren Sapp? <laughs> <laughs> that was a, I thought, well, the Tony Dungy was a part of that one. So, but oh, that's was, right. That's right. That's right. It was after that. But nonetheless, um, it makes all the sense in the world. So when you see a guy like Byron Murphy, first of all, we think about what most 300-pound men look like when we, when, we, when we walk into the malls or anywhere else, like they're not that athletic, right? So when you have a guy who is, at, you know, a 4.87, um, you know, on the 40-yard uh, dash, I think on the bench press, he did 28 reps at the combine. So, and he did 33 on the, on the vertical jump. So a guy like that, NFL team is going to look like and say he's got all the athleticism in the world and now you know he wasn't necessarily asked to be that person uh, to attack the quarterback and sack the quarterback because you know we want you to make sure you know fill these gaps uh, and let our our, our our back seven do all the work for you and he did it he did it at a, at a high rate so he, he's a guy that people look at as a top 15 kind of guy, maybe top 10-ish potentially. Never know what team is going to fall in love with him. Uh, but that's how good he is. You know, he, he's going to be probably, if not, uh, the the first uh, defensive tackle that comes off the board. If not, he'll be in top two. I know we've gone long here, Anwar, so I'll close with this. Anyone that we didn't mention that you really like, that you think – people in the NFL draft community and NFL front offices are underrating a lot based on what you saw from them at Texas? Um, I, 
I think you guys covered, you know, the most of them. You know, I think Jalen Ford is a linebacker who I think is, will be productive uh, for a team. I think a guy who's going to be just just sneaky, uh, just file him away. I don't. He, he'll he, maybe he's a late round pick if he's drafted at all. But I think he'll make a team as a special teams guy. Is is Keelan Robinson? Uh, he's a backup running back uh, for Texas. K E I L A N. Um, but I think he he ran about a four four two. But I think I want to say at his pro day, he's not the biggest guy. But I want to say at his pro day, I think he did over twenty reps on the bench. Wow. And I want to say he's a guy maybe he's like a five nine ish kind of kid. Uh, as, as I mentioned, Dave Megan, right? Uh, but I think he was like a you know five nine ish guy. He's a, he, he's tremendous on special teams. One of the things he did incredibly well on special teams is he he was very good at at blocking kicks. And, and blocking field goals, um, just really ch- talented. So he's a guy that I think he'll get on the team. I think he'll find a home somebody. I think he'll be a special teams guy. And I think a guy that in a few years you'll hear about him as a gadget guy. Uh, but just file Keelan Robinson away as, again, if you just want to be the smartest guy in the room <laughs> in three years to now bring up his name and everyone's like, how the heck did you know about that guy? <laughs> He's a guy that I think he'll, he's, he's going to make it as a special teams guy and be incredibly effective. And it's the, the last thing I want to say before we run, and by the way, I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, this, won't be the la- this won't be the last time that you and I talk. Uh, you know, Steve Sarkeesian, when he got here, they didn't have anybody drafted, not a single player that's drafted. You mentioned they're sending 11 guys to the combine this year. They've, 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 there's been a real huge development of talent, especially as they go into the SEC. Uh, they've been trying to shape and mold bodies to go and be productive and be able to compete against SEC players. And so you're going to see probably more of an impact from Texas, and you're probably going to see more guys starting to go to the combine and hear more names called. So just as we start, you know, we think of the Georgias of the world, you think of the Bamas of the world, of course, Michigan sent uh, half their damn team to the combine. It seems like um, going forward, when you start thinking about some of the turnover and transitions that have happened in college football, Texas has been doing really well from a recruiting standpoint, not only high school, but from the transfer portal. Clearly, there's enough money in Texas for NIL for them to attract guys. I mean, the, you know, there, there, there's no shortage of millionaires in this state. Um, and so just keep an eye on Texas going forward and start, start going forward. There's been no reason to pay attention to Texas for many, many years. But I, I'm, I've sensed a shift here. Uh, and I think this draft will be kind of the start of you starting to see them more consistently in more consistent names in the NFL as well. Just want to make sure I point that out. Well, and if sweat is not around anymore, there'll be more food to pass around to at the buffet. (laughs) So you'll be able to (laughs) feed the team. Texas barbecue for everybody, baby. Let's lock it in. Uh, Anwar, uh, tell your boys in the Bronx where they can find your work before we say goodbye. For anybody who's still down there in the boogie down, it's real simple. It's Anwar Richardson, A-N-W-A-R. Richardson. Uh, that's how you can find me on Twitter. You can follow me. I don't, I'm not one of these people who tweet 15, 16 times a day. I don't think what I have to say is that important. So when I do tweet, uh, you don't, don't worry about me being uh, me flooding your inbox or you have to turn off notifications. So just follow me, A-N-W-A-R. And I, I, I tweet about lots of different things. Uh, but that's how you can find me. I do shows on YouTube, but that's the easiest way to get me. Awesome. Anwar, great stuff, man. Uh, enjoy uh, the rest of what I'm sure is a busy offseason down there in Texas. I'm sure you have the spring stuff all starting up pretty soon. And uh, said, but by what you're saying, it sounds like we'll talk again next year. Appreciate the time, man. Yeah, thanks, Anwar. All right, guys. No problem. You guys take care. Always fun to talk to a guy from the Bronx, Anwar Richardson. Again, you can find his work at orangebloods.com. Lance, needless to say, a lot of really good players coming out of Texas. We could have six or seven picks here in the first two rounds alone. Yeah, it speaks volumes of the substance, I think, that's coming out of the program, and that goes back to what Anwar Richardson had to say, how things have drastically changed since Sarkeesian has taken over the program. Clearly, the biggest talk is about the interior defensive linemen, specifically Murphy and Sweat. I think if you look at today's NFL, John, we're starting to see interior defensive linemen can have an impact even if they don't necessarily get 
15 sacks a season. And these two guys fit within that profile because they're really good run stoppers. And if they could collapse the pocket, I mean, Murphy's a powerful guy. You watch him on film, John. I saw him push back just about every single offensive lineman. And he's that quick, too. Him. He's a good yeah. athlete. Very shifty. Mm-hmm. So teams are going to say, we could bring him in the mix, and then everybody else is going to eat. As a result of that. So, I'd actually love to put him next to Dexter Lawrence. I don't think the Giants that. are in a position where, yeah. you know, because he's probably going to get picked somewhere between like 10 and 20 or 15 and 25, so the Giants won't be in a position there. But his size profile next to Dexter as an up-the-field guy, perfect fit. And the athleticism that he brings to the table, too, because, you know, we're not talking about a guy that's in the 300-pound ballpark. He's right at the edge, so that still gives him some movement and flexibility. So those are two powerful guys that, if they could stay healthy, they could prove to be three-down linemen. There is extreme value to have them. And then as far as the offensive side of the ball, there's speed, there's versatility. I'm not overly concerned about Jonathan Brooks, the running back, his ACL. And the reason being, John... It's not a lot of mileage on the tires. So if you're an NFL front office, you say, hey, if he played full three years of college ball and was up there and carries, then he tears his ACL, to me, that'd be a red flag. Not so much the case that he's only coming off of one year where he's in triple digits of carries. And as far as Worthy is concerned, the wide receiver, he flourished as a slant guy. So if you're looking for that complimentary wide receiver and you want to bring somebody in on the slot who's not going to get a lot of attention because you have size on the outside, even though he's got a small frame. Heck, we talked about this with Devontae Smith who went to the Eagles. And how many years did we talk about how many games? Oh, this is going to be it. And he held up for the most part. So I don't get that concerned, especially if you're not going to give him an overwhelming amount of targets day in and day out. So I think Worthy to me and Brooks May not go early, but I think anybody that winds up with them is going to really like how they could be that complimentary piece to the lineup. I'll be curious to see if Worthy can sneak into the first round. As NFL teams become sure. more comfortable with smaller and slighter wide receivers. Look what Tank Dell did, for example, yeah, last year. Good example for the Texans. Again, but then again, people say, well, we told you Tank Dell wouldn't stay healthy because he's only 165 pounds. And lo and behold, he ended up getting hurt at the end of the year. So I still think there's a push and pull there with the smaller wide receivers. I'm curious to see if Worthy uh, can sneak into round one. I do think A.D. Mitchell will end up being a first-round pick given his profile, size, sure. speed, athleticism. I'm just, John, I, like I'm worried about what Anwar said. I mean, that to me is scary that he wasn't going full speed on plays where he knew he wasn't getting the ball. How many times you watch an NFL game, I see a wide receiver either on the backside or the front side of the play, and he's just, you know, holding the guy in front of him, but you could tell he has no interest or passion. It happens all the time. It happens a lot, I'll give you that, but if you already have that mindset going into the NFL... Not what you want. Well, because here's the thing. Coaches and players are great at film study in this day and age. Mm -hmm. They'll pick up those tendencies in the snap of a finger. That worries me because even if he gets with a great coaching staff, can you coach that out of a player if they've already adopted that so early in their football career? No, I totally agree. All right, 201-939-4513. Real quick, go subscribe to the John Settle Podcast. Two good episodes up there right now. Sean O'Hara from a couple days ago, then former NFL general manager Randy Mueller. Really fun conversation. He loved the Giants Hall and free agency. We did a breakdown on the draft prospects as well with the Giants. Might do it six. A lot of quarterback talk, a lot of wide receiver talk. So go tune into the Giants Settle Podcast. Giants.com, Giants Mobile App. Favorite podcast platform. You can find Draft Season, our draft podcast there as well with Tony, Pauline, and I. Right now we're kind of going through team needs and ideal picks for each team uh, since we have a better idea of what these rosters look like after free agency. All right, let's get to the phones at 201-939-4513. Tyler and Long Beach will lead us off. Hi, Tyler. Hey, John. Hey, Lance. How you guys doing? We're good. Doing all right. What's going on? Uh, I would like to see the Giants take a similar approach to the draft as the Packers did last year. Um, the Packers double up on two positions, wide receivers, tight end, and they let Matt LaFleur go to work. Um, I think it's an approach that the Giants should look at, just go a little heavier on offense, let Brian Dable do what he has, do what he does best. Um, I do that, think that second-round pick might be a sweet spot for a defensive need, whether it's a tackle, if we could get Hall if he slips from Ohio State, or another big corner to uh, put opposite Deontay Banks. But uh, I think it was just very beneficial for the Packers last year. It led to a lot of Jordan Love's success, uh, what he had surrounded to him. And their playoff run, a lot of those guys were, you know, um, contributors on offense, Musgrave, Kraft, Jaden Reed, obviously, and then Wicks down the stretch. So 
Um, I would like to see the Giants go heavy on offense this year. Do you want to draft two wide receivers, Tyler? Because I, I actually got a tweet about this the other day, and I replied that I'm not sure I would double up in wide receiver in this draft, especially if you use your sixth overall pick on a wide receiver, because you already have Hyatt, who's been in the league only one year, Wando Robinson, who's been only in the league for two years. You still have Darius Slayton under contract. He's not an older player. I, I'm not sure if you want to use, you know, if you want to use like a fifth or, or sixth round pick maybe on a wide receiver. Hodgins okay, too. I'm fine with that. But I, I'm not sure I would use two premium picks on a wide receiver just because I don't think they're going to get on the field much. For sure. I wouldn't say that I'm saying double up on the positions, but I would like to see an offensive approach, even if it's, you know, like you were talking about with Christian Jones before. Yep. Um, just heavy offense. I agree know. with you. Maybe it's a, a premier wide receiver, hopefully. But I would like to see a running back, maybe Blake Corum in like the third or fourth. Um, just, you know, we need contributors on the offensive side of the ball. For the last three years, we've had nothing. Um, and I would just like to see them go heavy on offense, whether it's a tackle, guard, center, whatever it is. I think that a lot of their focus this year should be on offense. Well, it's going to be interesting in terms of the offensive line because, I mean, they've brought in, what, five offensive linemen already. And let's face it, all these guys are not making the roster. They're going to compete, and they're going to let the best man win. And you've got some young guys that were hurt last year who you did draft recently that you're hoping maybe can stay healthy in battle. I'm just concerned if you start doubling and tripling up on some of these positions, there's not going to be enough roster spots for a lot of these guys. Yeah, you have you to take that like into consideration. One receiver, one tight end, one offensive lineman. If you kind of work it like that, I think you can yeah, work. I think that I'm, would be all right. But yeah, that's I, what I'm thinking I, I see too. what you're saying. Yeah, I would. That's more of that's how I probably should have phrased it. But you know, a tight end is probably going to be positional need as well. The so tight end, running back, someone on the line, and then maybe wide receiver at the first. I think that's you know, and then I also think that second round pick is where we're going to probably look for uh, a defensive need, or you know, obviously, you know, best player avail- available teamed up with you know positional need. Um, but I do think a majority of this draft should be offensive. Mm-hmm. Fair point. Just real quickly, last caller used the Packers. Appreciate the Packers have a track record of building their team through the draft. They do not usually go out and serve as aggressors in free agency. Now, they did that a little bit this offseason. Jacobs McKinney. Correct. But that was a rare occurrence, John. Yep. So Green Bay is a good example, but they've built the blueprint that says, we're going to put all of our resources into the draft. We're going to develop. And keep in mind, the reason why I also think Green Bay is a good example is you were transitioning to a young quarterback, John. And to me, it's important in the NFL. You want the offensive personnel to grow together. So now you have Jordan Love simultaneously moving up the ladder with a young core, meaning guys are going to be on similar contracts. You hope to keep that group together. Giants are not necessarily in the same ballpark. Now, could they draft a quarterback at six? Perhaps, but there's still no guarantee that quarterback gets on the field immediately. So you'd still have a veteran in Daniel Jones, or if you go with Drew Locke, who's only on a one-year deal, trying to grow up with a younger core. You're not necessarily on the same page as you are in Green Bay. I just think that's something else to not overlook and dismiss, that just because one team did it right— doesn't mean the Giants are in the same position to adopt that. Agreed. And just real quick on your offensive line point, Lance, I think it's a good one. Here are the offensive linemen current on the Giants roster, okay? This is based off the recent moves and off the Giants roster page on the website. Jermaine Illuminor. That's one. Josh Azudu, You can count for me. Marcus McKeithen. Aaron Stinney. Those are all new additions. Um, Evan Neal. Andrew Thomas. Let me see. I guess they have guard under G, huh? I was looking for O. Um, and then inside, they have... John Runyon. And how do they have this thing arranged here? Center. Okay, John Michael Schmitz. And that, and then I guess Matt Nelson is the newest guy that's got Correct. added, right? Correct. Former Lion. Doesn't look like he's been added to the uh, roster page yet. So those are the guys that I see on the roster right now. So I guess it, it's understandable why they wanted to add some bodies there. And if you want to look at the guys on futures contracts, Lance. Well, I was going to say, well, those guys, real quick, I don't mean to cut you off. I don't think you mentioned Austin Schlotman. No, I guess okay. he hasn't been added to the so roster page that's yet. 10. That's another one. Okay. And then they have Jalen Mayfield and Joshua Miles as well. That's 12. As guys that were on the practice squad. So you're looking at probably nine or 10 offensive linemen on the opening day roster. Probably nine is more realistic. Yeah, so- maybe eight. So it, it's a lot of people in the building right now. Yeah. And once again, nobody's guaranteed to have a roster spot. Even some of these guys they brought in in free agency. But unless you're taking an offensive lineman, John. 
in the first two rounds, you're bringing in a mid-round, late-round guy. Yeah, he's going to come and he's going to compete. But once again, I don't know if he's going to have enough time to make enough of an inroad to solidify a roster spot. And you may be better off using your draft capital on somebody that has a more legitimate shot to get on the field and develop so that you're not waiting till year four of the rookie contract to determine yeah. whether or not you want to re-sign the guy. All right, let's go to James in Georgia. He's up next. Hi, James. Hey, what's going on, guy? Um, what's up? I know sometimes I, I call and my call can be a little everywhere, so... I let me try to focus a little bit. Um, who do you think, if the draft doesn't go well for us and we're not able to land a quarterback, one of the top six quarterbacks, in my opinion, right? Who do you think, free agency wise, is going to be available and make sense money wise as a camp body? Because, again, we're going to need camp bodies just to hold practice before the season starts and do you think that they will uh, like aggressively gra- draft somebody no matter what to help that situation or if the draft doesn't fall our way and we don't get one of those top six guys from Caleb Williams to Bo Nick that we will look towards um, the backside of free agency good question um, and, and James, appreciate the call. Thank you, as always. And Pierce, we can try to squeeze one more in here if you want. Um, looking at the free agency list here. I mean, I have it up here, John. I mean, they could very well bring left? in a veteran. But, I mean, I would think between Drew Locke and Tommy DeVito, you can give those guys plenty of work. Usually you like to have a third arm in the yeah. spring. But, and, I mean, and, you know, Daniel, they, they did point out that Daniel might be able to do some non-contact stuff throwing the ball. Has, has someone signed Rudolph yet? Mason Rudolph? Mason Rudolph, yes, went he to Tennessee. Been signed. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you still got the guys that you have out there, Ryan Tannehill, Brian Hoyer. Yeah, I don't think Tannehill Nate would Sudfeld, be a guy. I think Hoyer's going to retire. Carson Wentz is still out there. Kyle Dobbs. Allen. Dobbs signed with the Niners. Oh, did he? Yeah, All right, that Dobbs wasn't not updated there. On See, this page then. if I'm the Giants, I would think if you don't draft a guy, John, and if you disagree, that's fine. You're looking, I think, maybe at this stage, somebody who's a little bit younger. I agree. Right? Who you can still develop and evaluate their arm. So I'll give you an example. And I would say, you know, he said top six quarterbacks. I think your third camp body might be like a fifth or sixth round quarterback then. You know, yeah. you don't get one you of the very top well six. Do that. You know, draft a Devin Leary or someone like that in the on day three, that can be your third ca- arm in camp. Sure. Because you already have your veteran unlocked. You don't need another veteran. No, but if you want it, that's why I'm saying you find the best of both worlds. You find somebody that was already drafted but is still young enough yeah, sure. that I can still that. develop. So the few guys that I'm looking at, you've got Easton Stick, who is the Chargers backup to Justin Herbert. He's 28 years old and clearly barely got on the field, given who was in front of him. John Wolford, the former Ram who filled in when... Goff and Stafford got banged up. You know, he's also in that 28-year-old ballpark. Tyler Huntley actually is out there. I don't think he signed, but let me no, just confirm. He did not, I right? believe. The no, former Baltimore Raven I'm talking him. about that backed up Lamar Jackson. All of those guys are in the age bracket where they're not in their 30s, and maybe you could still get a little bit more out of them in terms of their development. So those are the veterans that I would look at if th- you still want to bring in somebody after the draft. I think Easton Stick is still Chargers property. He still is? Because I'm I looking at him. He he's might have just he's signed, on my list here he might as a free agent, but maybe he did sign. Them. It's I could possible. be wrong about that. I believe he is on the Chargers roster page. Or was okay. it Jacob Easton that signed somewhere? One of, it was either Easton Stick or Jacob Easton. I always get those two guys <laughs> confused. One of those two guys signed somewhere. I'm trying to remember. Let well, me let's see. see. Stick was a fifth-round pick in 2019. So 19, 20, 21, 22. Uh, clearly, he, let's see, did he sign a short-term? Did he signed a one-year deal in 2023 to he stay with the team? He on the and Chargers March 16th, yeah. he re-signed. Okay, I didn't see that. So that was a few days ago. So take Easton Sticks How could you Sticks not name? know exactly Off the what board. Easton Stick signed? I mean, my God. Yeah, it's I know. essential to the NFL. Well, I didn't get alerts on my phone, so I apologize. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you mean uh, Tom Pelissero was sending out <laughs> alerts about, no, but, about which agent negotiated that contract on Twitter? No? I know. Yeah, apparently that wasn't a priority tweet. But see, this is another example of why, see, I bring up my list of free agents here and sometimes they don't update yes. this accordingly. Same thing. That's so, why I thought you know, Josh Donaldson. I'm Donald still seeing his though. name and clearly he's off the board. So more of a reason why everybody should be careful when you look at various web pages because sometimes they're not updated religiously. If I asked you right now, who's the, what's the Giants' five starting offensive linemen next year and in what positions? Five starting offensive linemen. Okay, let me bring up my yep. chart because I just mm-hmm. like to visualize it. So I'll go... Andrew Thomas, left tackle. That's bold. I know. Okay. Well, listen, you told me all five, so I'm going to start with the <laughs> obvious and go accordingly <laughs> from that standpoint. I'll go with John Runyon at left guard. Okay. And I know he's played both, but he did say on a conference call he prefers left. Yep. So I'll stick with that. John Michael Schmitz at center. You know, the mystery right now is the right guard position because you have a few different options. So here's where I'll go with right now. I'll go with... Jermaine Illuminor at right guard and then Evan Neal at right tackle. That's what okay, I have to, to start. That's what okay? I have to. All bets are off, though, based on what happens in terms of training camp. But right now, I'm going to give Neal the benefit of the doubt. New offensive line coach, healthy, that he will do everything to solidify that job. And the good news is Illuminor has versatility where he can play inside and outside. To your point, Evan Neal, I think we're at the point now in year three that's a job he's going to have to play well enough to keep, especially with Jermaine Illuminar on the sure. roster, a guy that started for the Giants offensive line coach for two years in, in Vegas and, and did a yeoman's work, you know, was a, was a solid, yeah. you know, average NFL starter, right? I think he especially did a nice as a run job. blocker. Yeah, he, yeah. Did, he did a good job. Uh, so he's going to have to earn that spot. This is, I don't, you know, this set my sense. And why would you bring in a guy like Illuminar if it wasn't that, you know, Joe Shane, still, Joe Shane said it at his postseason press conference. Evan Neal has to play better. And I think that's where we're at. I think he has it in him. I think he can do it. But he's going to have to do it. And I wouldn't be shocked, Lance. And I don't think any decisions will be made in the spring because pads aren't on, so you can't really see these guys truly play offensive line until you get to the summer. But I think once we get two weeks into training camp and you maybe you get into that first joint practice against that other team before the first preseason game, if they haven't seen what they want to see, maybe that's when we can start maybe seeing a shift there. If Illuminor moves out to right tackle, he moves into guard, or, or something like that to try to figure out what the best fit is on that side of the line. Well, and here's the other thing. Normally, when we talk about offensive linemen, John, we say if somebody doesn't win a starting job, you like that they can be insurance elsewhere. Neil doesn't have that positional flexibility. I mean, he played start left tackle in college. Well, but I guess it's more of he'd be the swing tackle. I'm talking about could guard be an option, I guess is what I was thinking more. He has See, some guard experience in college, but it's a long but, time ago. Yeah, and, you know, once again, do they feel comfortable with him as opposed to a Stinney or a Schlotman right. who they brought in that already has more recent experience at guard? So that, to me, puts even more on the plate of Evan Neal to say, hey, right now my focus is I want to win the right tackle job. But in the event I don't, how do they look at me as a swing tackle and could I then carve out some type of an opportunity at guard? You know, That to me is a lot more challenging than some of these other individuals that are already on the roster. All right, final final question on this topic because I think it's interesting. I was listening to the uh, PFF NL podcast the other day and Sam Monson and Steve Palazzolo were making the case of why Joe Alt should still be a primary option for the Giants at sixth overall. And yes, Joe Alt would still be an option for me at sixth overall as well. But here's my reasoning why I ultimately, I don't think, would make that pick. And it's not because I think either Illuminor or Evan Neal are you know, going to be long-term better right tackles than Joe Alt. That's not the reasoning. In my opinion, you get to that sixth pick, Joe Alt maybe is the top player on your board, but I think one of those three top wide receivers is, at least for me, either going to be slightly higher graded or at least right at the same level in terms of grade. And for me, at least, I think you have enough insurance in-house at right tackle to feel okay about it between Neil and Illuminor. You want to give Neil one more chance to earn that job. You have Illuminor as your fallback. And I just feel the need at wide receiver to have another explosive playmaker on offense in an offseason where... Darren Waller's health and future is still up in the air, apparently. Yeah. And Saquon Barkley is no longer with the team, your most explosive weapon on offense. Since their grades and the 
the, the level of the player is right on the same level, I'm going to lean towards wide receiver over offensive tackle just because I think the offense desperately needs it. And that's kind of where I land on it. Well, I'll add another layer to this. If they did not have an answer at left tackle, John, my answer would be I'll take Joe Alt because I feel really good about his experience there in college. A thousand and times out of a thousand. I'm putting him in the position he played in school. If you draft Joe Alt regardless of the upside and how good you feel about him, you're going to put him in a position he did not play at college. I'd be worried about that, John. Sixth overall pick, you want to draft the closest thing to a sure thing, not the closest thing to more questions. It wouldn't stop me from making the pick, but I think it's a question you have about it that you don't have about any of the receivers that you'd be considering. Yeah, Odunze, Neighbors, who cares whether you play him on the left side or the right side? Or inside or outside. <laughs> I mean, anywhere you want. The guy is an uh, explosive playmaker. He's a talent. Something tells me he'll find ways to get open. So that would be another big part of why I'd go wide receiver playmaker point. over offensive lineman. I'll throw one more in there, too. You just signed Andrew Thomas to an extension. When that extension's over, he'll be, what, like, 30 years old, probably, give or take, something like that, 31. Yeah. That's young for an offensive tackle. Oh, he's You'll good for another contract. One more big contract yeah. after that. Yeah. How many NFL teams, Lance, can you remember that have paid two offensive tackles at the same time, top of the market money? So if you draft Joe Walton, he works out and he hits, right? Which is your county on. And he hits free agency in five years and he's asking for the Andrew Thomas contract. Can you afford to pay two offensive tackles 55 to $60 million of your salary cap? Especially if at that point you're paying a quarterback money too, and you're paying Brian Burns money, and you're paying Dexter Lawrence money. Where's the play? Where are you paying a playmaker in that conversation? So I think with the way you put the roster together, I think it's hard to pay two really good offensive tackles at the same time. I feel much more comfortable allocating some money to an offensive tackle and then some money to a wide receiver, which again, you would hope you're doing with whatever wide receiver you're drafted, you're signing him to a big time contract extension in four or five years. So I think from a team building perspective, it makes more sense to go wide receiver too, just because I think it's hard to have two 25 plus million dollar offensive tackles on your roster at any given time. You no, know, it's interesting. I didn't necessarily think about that item, John, only because I just wonder, is Joe Shane thinking that far ahead? Probably not. Given the fact that, you know, Joe Alt's on a rookie contract, I'll wait four or five years. Plus, remember, you get the fifth-year option, too, with Joe Alt. I can think that way. No, He's no, probably and not. And that's fine. You really took it to 75 layers away from what I was thinking. It's something that I'm sure maybe is a conversation piece. It makes sense, though, right? Well, of because course. you would hope in five years that Joe Walton and Andrew Thomas well, would still be Well, that's the whole point of drafting tackles, a guy, right? right? What do I yeah. always say? I say you want to draft a guy that warrants a second contract. Correct. Not a guy that warrants saying goodbye and go elsewhere <laughs> defeats the purpose. So it's definitely something to take into consideration. And off the top of my head, you'd be hard-pressed, I agree, to find a team that invested that type of money on the bookends, on the offensive line. More often than not, they have to let one of the guys walk. They sign somebody in free agency or they draft somebody. So that point is well taken. But in the Giants position, I guess, and they're not in this position because, once again, Joel gives me questions because you'd be putting him on the right side. But given the offensive line issues that they had, if a GM is saying, if I could get security on both edges for my quarterback, I don't know if you're too worried about the fifth-year option expiring and now I got to pay the guy at the position that I already paid the left tackle. So totally maybe and, not as much stress. And by the way, Andrew will only be 30 years old when his contract expires. In 2029. Well, it's a good way, problem to have. It's a, yeah. it, it's a long ways off. So as a super big picture thing, <laughs> I, I just like balancing the roster a little bit better by by going after the wide receiver. Just food for thought as you consider what the Giants might do at number six. Lance, this was fun. We've done 100%. This in a while. This is good. Absolutely. Just real quick. Hey, yeah. there's a team that averaged 15 points a game last season. So you need a playmaker. To our first caller's point, you got you got to figure out a way to score more points, man. Yeah. Absolutely. You have to. I'm with you. For Lance Meadow, I'm John Schmelk. Um, I am off Monday. Uh, it'll be, I believe, Lance and Paul on Monday, yes. if I'm not mistaken. Correct. So tune in for that. Do you know what college team it is on top of your UCLA, head? I know, is one of them. I did not. I think, look, I I think it's U two West Coast. I think Coast. I put UCLA and USC It may be UCLA show. and USC. I, I think that sounds that. right. I also put yep. North Carolina and Duke on the same shell, if I'm not mistaken. I'm, rivalry I'm, I'm, in I'm basketball. I'm trying to keep the rivalry in football. As yeah. best I can. All right, so we'll have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll see you on Monday on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Are you self-conscious about your smile due to stains? Have you ever wished that you had a whiter and brighter smile? Smile Actives is a safe and affordable alternative to expensive whitening procedures. 
you simply add Smile Active's gel to your toothpaste every time you brush your teeth, making it the easiest teeth whitening solution out there. In a clinical trial, Smile Active's users reported up to five shades whiter on average, all within seven days. No change to your routine, no extra time. Right now, they are running a buy one, get one offer. Hurry to smileactives.com slash iHeart today to receive this special offer with free shipping and handling. What's up, y'all? Janice Torres here. And I'm Austin Hankwitz. We're the hosts of Mind the Business, Small Business Success Stories, a podcast presented by iHeart Radio's Ruby Studios and Intuit QuickBooks. Join us as we speak with small business owners about the tools they use to turn their ideas into success. From finding that initial spark of entrepreneurship to organizing payments and invoices, we've got you covered. So follow and listen to Mind the Business Small Business Success Stories on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts.